Good morning. Uh, thanks so much, Dr. West, for the invitation. And um, I'll be talking about brain as a sanctuary uh, in patients with molecularly driven lung cancer. Uh, but before I go forward, this is actually a very unusual uh, circumstance for me because I think since I've been practicing, I've never been in a situation where I'm actually faced directly with so many patients all at once. Uh, so this is actually a great opportunity for me to gain from collective wisdom because, you know, we all go to meetings, we talk to one another about what the next great idea is going to be that we're going to try and who has the best uh, idea or structure in their institution and what they're doing to help patients, but really to have the patient who are going through this treatment on a day-by-day -day basis, not just one that you meet on a one-on-one -on -one basis in your office, but as a collection of people with real life experience of what this is all about, I think really creates an opportunity for me to learn. And I hope that by the end of this uh, uh, program today, I will learn a lot to take back to uh, Atlanta to further refine what we're doing and what we hope to do going forward. So what I want to do is not so much talk about what is brain metastasis. I think uh, a lot of people in this audience know that inside out. But my goal is to put this in the context of what Dr. Ray Camp already mentioned and what the other breakout sessions will be addressing, which is how does involvement of the brain impact what we are trying to achieve? The ultimate goal of all of our effort is to render lung cancer to be, if not something we can cure, at least render it to be a chronic disease. Most people have diabetes, a lot of people have hypertension, and it doesn't sound like a death sentence. So if we can get cancer to be something like that that people can relate to as a chronic disease, we don't want it, but at least it becomes something that we can live with, and it doesn't stop us from doing whatever we have to do. So if you look at brain metastasis, it's actually not a very common event. If you just look at general population, only about 10 out of 100,000 people in the population in the US would have something to do with brain metastasis. But when you start talking about patients with cancer, it becomes a real problem. One of every 10 patients with cancer diagnosis of any type will, during the course of the disease, have to deal with brain metastasis. And this information came primarily from population-based studies, a lot of it done in Detroit, uh, where they looked at their registry and looked at number of patients developing brain metastasis in the context of cancer diagnosis. And as you can see from here, lung cancer actually is one of the cancers with the most frequent uh, occurrence of brain metastasis. About 20% of all patients are actually turn out to be uh, lung cancer patients. The other thing about brain metastasis is that it's not a snapshot that stays frozen in time. It changes over time. So when they went back to look at the pattern of brain metastasis 20 years ago in the 80s and compared to now, there were some changes that became apparent. One is that while lung cancer still remains the number one cancer associated with brain metastasis, other cancers are also showing up to be uh, causes of brain metastasis. For instance, colorectal cancer and kidney cancer actually showed a tripling of the prevalence of brain metastasis as compared to 20 years prior. Uh, the incidence for lung cancer went down a little bit just because you have a lot of other cancers also showing up as causes of brain metastasis. <coughs> when you look at specific subtypes of cancer, so patients with ALK positive cancer in general tend to have a higher incidence of brain metastasis, and I'm not talking of small cell where close to 40 to 50% of patients with small cell lung cancer during the course of the disease would develop metastasis in the brain. So just focusing on the non-small cell subtype, we know that the ALK positive subtype tend to be the type where you see a lot more incidence of brain metastasis. And this has been borne out by observation in clinical studies where you look at patients at the time of original diagnosis or later in the course of their disease, and you look at the incidence of brain metastasis, you see that the longer the patients live, the more likely you like uh, to see them come down with brain metastasis. Some of this is perhaps due to the fact that the biology of this disease predisposes patients to develop the cancer in their brain, 
But other things may re reflect what we have to treat the patient. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit as we go forward. From autopsy theories, so when they look at patients who die from different causes and they look at patients with cancer, the incidence of brain matter is actually much higher than what you see from population studies, indicating that there may even be patients with brain metastasis that do not have symptoms and we do not know that they have brain metastasis and not, nothing was ever done before the patient actually died. And if you look at autopsy series, patients with melanoma tend to have a higher incidence of brain metastasis, up to 40% of those patients have brain metastasis and a third of patients with breast cancer. So why do we think that there is this increasing number of patients with brain metastasis? Uh, I think some of it is very obvious. Uh, if you look at the practice pattern in the US in the last 20, 30 years, only about 2% of patients get brain MRI. Uh, they may have other sort of imaging, maybe CT scan, or even maybe just skull X-ray. Uh, but currently, more than 60% of patients will get an MRI during the evaluation of their disease. So we are looking for it, therefore we are more likely to find it. That's one reason. The other reason is there is also a shift in the uh, distribution of cancer types. So if you have more types of cancer that can go to the brain, you're more likely to have patients with brain metastasis. So incidence of lung cancer, especially in women, continue to rise in men. It's plateaued and uh, coming down. And other cancers like melanoma and kidney cancer, they're also rising and they have uh, pre predilection to go to the brain. We are also victims of our own success, no, no matter how small they might be. So as we come up with all these new agents, as Dr. Rekamp mentioned, we are impacting patient outcome, patients are living longer. And the longer patients live, the more likely that the cancer cells will become abnormal and have the capacity to, to go to the brain. So the net effect of all this is that we are more likely to have patients with brain involvement. So we cannot avoid it. But if it happens, the question is how do we understand it better and what do we do about it? The observation in the breast cancer space was actually very germane to what we are going through now. When the HER2 story came and they developed antibodies to HER2 and everybody was hoping that that would be the cure for breast cancer. The first care actually came when they started noticing that patients treated with HER2 antibodies tended to develop more brain metastasis. And until it was sorted out that it was a combination of factors. One, tumors that were HER2 driven are more likely to go to the brain. Two, the HER2 antibody doesn't get into the brain. And three, these patients are living longer. So it's not that the treatment itself is the one causing the brain metastasis, but a, uh, a collection of factors both positive and negative, that led to increased diagnosis of brain metastasis in that population of patients. And we're beginning to see similar thing in our lung cancer patient population, especially the ALK positive lung cancer patient. So what makes the brain a sanctuary for cancer metastasis? You know, uh, it's when Dr. West told me to talk about it, like a sanctuary, where I need to figure out what this is. English is my second language. So, I went on Wikipedia, and you know the simple definition of sanctuary is a sacred place, such as a shrine. You know, usually where people run to for safe haven. Uh, but people also use it in common uh, uh, usage as a shelter from damage or hardship, or somewhere where you go to seek protection or safety. So the brain, by by nature, it's a sanctuary. Our body actually does not want anything bad to happen to the brain, and that is why the brain is so well protected. It's difficult for anything to get into the brain, and it's difficult for anything to get out of the brain. Same for cancer. It's difficult for cancer cells to get into the brain, but if we are unlucky and the cancer gets there, it's also difficult for us to get at the cancer cells within the brain. So this is truly a sanctuary, uh, and there are reasons why it is. So this is what we call the blood-brain barrier, and this is not to throw things at you, but to make it simple, uh, you can look at the blood circulation as our interstate highway, and the brain as maybe Pennsylvania Avenue. So you can get on interstate and go anywhere you want. But if you get on Pennsylvania Avenue, there are areas you cannot get into without some sort of security clearance. That is sort of how the brain is. So anything that gets into the brain can freely circulate and move around the body. But for you to get into the brain, you need special 
procedures to get in. And what I've listed there are different mechanisms by which things can get into the brain normally. And as you can see, there is a lot of protection for the brain so that things don't just get into the brain without some assistance. When you have cancer, some cancer cells can have propensity to bypass some of these uh, uh, hurdles and get into the brain. And occasionally, once cancer gets into the brain, it's a gift that gives, keeps giving because it destroys this barrier and then allows more cancer cells to get into the brain, what we call the destruction of the blood-brain barrier. The other aspect of the blood-brain barrier is there is also a fail-safe mechanism that if something were to manage to get through that barrier, the body has the ability to get rid of it by pumping it out of the brain before it causes any damage. And this is where it becomes important in terms of medicines that we use to treat cancer, especially when we want it to get into the brain. Even if the drug works very well in the rest of the body and it managed to get into the brain, the brain has a mechanism to pump that drug out before it gets to the cancer cells. And this is another reason why the brain can turn out to be a sanctuary for, for cancer. So when you look at this cartoon, whether the cancer starts in the lung, in the breast, or any other part of the body, in order for it to get to the brain is a very complex process. We know that when cancer cells dissociate, they tend to move together as a group. There is power in number, and there is well-demonstrated mechanisms that when you have cancer cells in isolation, they tend to die. But for cancer to move from one part of the body to another, they have to dissociate. So that means the cancer cells must have the capacity capacity to survive in the bloodstream in order to get into the brain and then navigate its way through the brain. So there's been a lot of work that's been done, and I'm not going to go into that, only to show that we still have a lot to learn as to why cancer cells develop, the capacity to get into the brain, how they get into the brain, and how they manage to survive in the brain. But to distill that down into uh, specific mechanisms that we can exploit to take care of patients. This is actually a review, this is not projecting well, uh, that we did last year, looking at different mechanisms by which cancer can get into the brain and what we can explore in that mechanism as treatment for patients. Uh, the top uh, cartoon there is showing different aspects of lung cancer biology that can be exploited. But I've distilled this into three main areas. One is the astrocyte, which is the the structure of the brain itself. So the brain tends to nurture itself. So if you have an injury to the brain, there are what we call the astrocytes. These are the supporting cells within the brain that nurture the brain cells back to normal. And it has been shown in some experiments that when you have cancer cells managed to get into the brain, the astrocytes, rather than consider this as foreign that shouldn't be in the brain, can actually continue to nurture the cancer cells, and that can promote the growth of the cancer cells. The other mechanism is blood flow. So for cancer to grow, there has to be blood supply from somewhere. And if the cancer cells manage to get into the brain, they either have to co-opt the existing blood vessels in the brain or stimulate the production of new blood vessels. And uh, elegant experiment has been done in animals showing that if you can manage to reduce the level of blood supply to the uh, cancer cells within the brain, you can reduce the survival of those cells in the brain. Actually, there is a clinical trial where they used a similar strategy uh, with sediranib, which is a drug that reduces the amount of blood vessel formation, and that led to improved uh, efficacy of radiation treatment when they combine it with, uh, with sediranib. Uh, telling us again that perhaps we think outside the box, some of the tools that we currently have can also provide us opportunities to better attack the sanctuary in the brain that the cancer cells are, are using to protect themselves. And the final thing is the biology of the cancer cells themselves. As I mentioned, not every cancer type goes to the brain. And not every cancer cell that gets to the brain managed to survive. So people have gone back to look at tumor cells and look at what is it about these tumor cells that make them be able to go into the brain and survive in the brain and also look at tumor cells within the brain that have managed to get there and look at the gene profile to say, can we understand what is unique to these cancer cells that make it possible for them 
to get to the brain and survive. And some of the findings that, as you can see here, EGFR, as Dr. Rekam mentioned, is one factor that has been associated with ability of cancer cells to get into the brain. The other thing was uh, COX-2. Dr. Rekamp actually did a study where they looked at the COX-2 inhibitor uh, in combination with chemotherapy, even though the goal of that study was not to look at the effect in the brain. But we do have drugs that can modulate this type of uh, mechanism. And it is possible that if we better understand why cancer goes to the brain and what is involved, this may be additional opportunities for us to add to what we already have as standard treatment for cancers. The final thing is what we do uh, in terms of treatment that can also lead to the development of brain metastasis. And I'm going to use three different scenarios uh, to sort of clarify this for us. So we can imagine a situation where a patient has lung cancer that has spread to the brain at the time of the original diagnosis, and the cancer type is the one that responds well to targeted agent, be it serotonib or alexinib, and the drug can cross the blood-brain barrier. So when you treat the patient, you have good response in the body as well as within the brain. So this type of patient is going to do well. The brain is not likely to be the sanctuary site for this particular patient. But if you look at a different patient where they have similar spread of the cancer to the brain as well as to the rest of the body, even though you have an effective drug that can take care of the cancer, let's say Tosiva, for instance, or Eraser for EGFR mutant, but they do not cross the blood-brain barrier, therefore, all, most of your treatment is just stopping at the level of the neck. Beyond that, you're not able to attack what is going on in the brain. The brain then becomes the sanctuary for the patient. So you may do well in the body, but you have to now come and uh, develop a new strategy for attacking what is going on in the brain so that this does not become uh, the site of failure for the patient. And then the final thing is you can have a patient who does not even have brain metastasis to start with. They have cancer that is very sensitive. You treat them, they did very well, and they live very long. And this is some of the things that we're now saying, that with some of the effective therapies that we have, patients are living longer. But as Dr. Rekamp mentioned, eventually resistance develops. And when resistance develops, it doesn't just say that the drug stops working. It also means that the biology and the behavior of the cancer cells will change. So a cancer that in the beginning did not have the capacity to go to the brain, when it becomes resistant, may actually acquire the capacity now to travel to the brain. And this would be a scenario where just saying that we have a new drug will not be sufficient because your new drug may work extracranially outside the brain but may not work in the brain. So you have to have a strategy for taking care of this. So there have been studies done, most of these, especially in EGFR mutant tumors, uh, this is just a summary. Uh, most of them have looked at different ways of using EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitors, mostly Tosiva and Iresor. Uh, whether alone or in combination with radiation to sort of address this problem of brain as a sanctuary for cancer. If you look very closely to the right, uh, that is actually the outcome for most of the patient when any of these strategies were, was evaluated. This is not what we would expect. You know, for most of our patients these days, if they have EGFR mutant tumors, we want them to live longer. We do not want to see progression-free survival of six, seven, eight months. So while this is encouraging based on where they were five, six years ago, for us at this point, this will not be sufficient because if all we can do is control the disease for six, seven months, that is still not good enough. So what else can be done? Uh, we know that there's going to be the breakout session where this will be discussed in further details, but at least we are beginning to see signal of very effective drugs that can get into the brain and that can lead to good control of disease within the brain. And this is where we have to be systematic and strategic in how we use this drug. We're having so many different options of drugs that we can use. I think we're probably going to evolve to a situation where it's not going to be, we have Zakori, we have Seritinib, we have this, we have that not only are we going to have to individualize treatment based on the molecular profile, but we also have to do that based on where the disease is. So if all the drugs are equally effective, some may be 
much more effective in the brain than outside the brain. And that may be a reason why you want to select a particular drug for a particular patient, rather than say, well, they're all approved, you have a positive tumor, and then we're going to use it. And I think for all of us in the field, that is really where the, uh, uh, the field is moving, how we match the patient to available therapy based on the unique characteristics of the patient. This is just a summary slide showing that in ALK positive lung cancer, when you look at the incidence of brain metastasis, we are a victim of our own success. The longer patients live, the more likely they are to have uh, brain involvement. And while I'm not here to say one drug is better than the other, this is just to show the reason why we have to be selective and strategic. So when you look at a drug like alexinib versus crizotinib, and you look at their presence in the brain, because that is what you want. If it's going to work in the brain, it has to get into the brain. So when you compare the ability of crizotinib to get into the brain to that of alexinib, crizotinib actually does not get well into the brain. Uh, granted that there has been patients who benefited even on crizotinib with evidence of disease response in the brain, but it would appear that Patients treated with alexinib are more likely to benefit in terms of brain response than patients treated with crizotinib. And this was well demonstrated in this experiment. I, just to summarize, what they try to do here is to say, if a drug can get into the brain and you have cancer in the brain, that is the type of drug you want to use. So this is an animal experiment where they put the tumor in the brain of a mouse and then they treated the animals with different drugs, crizotinib as well as alectinib and vehicle. And what you can see is the longer the patient, uh, the longer the animal lives, the more effective the treatment is. So animals that were treated with alectinib live much longer than those treated with crizotinib. Of course, animals treated with crizotinib live longer than those treated with nothing. So if all we have is crizotinib, it's not too bad. But if we have something better than crizotinib and there is access to it, then that's probably what is going to be better to use for the patient. Uh, this is just a summary slide. I'm not here to bash any drug. This is actually published data showing that when you use crizotinib, if anyone is on crizotinib, I don't want you to leave here thinking, oh, I'm on the wrong treatment. I need to go stop crizotinib. No. What I'm saying is this is actually evidence from the real world that people who got crizotinib also benefited in the brain. But when you compare the degree of benefit and the number of patients who derive benefit compared to other drugs that can get into the brain better, it's not as, uh, as impressive. I think I'll skip this because we're going to have the breakout session during which time we'll talk more about uh, the treatment of ALK. I'm sorry, I'm just going to skip this in the interest of time so that we have more time for uh, discussion. Uh, but this will be my last slide uh, showing that when you treat patients with brain metastasis with some of these drugs, in this case, this is alectinib, uh, you are able to influence what is going on in the brain and patients do derive benefit regardless of whether or not they got radiation to the brain before they got treated with, with the drug. And with that, I will stop and take questions. <laughs>